Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing uh, immunofluorescence. Okay, so we were just about to discuss the structure of another important fluorochrome molecule, uh, which is very important in experimental biology. Okay, now this other molecule is known as Tritzy, so it has a similar name to Fitzy, which we've just seen. Okay, so Tritzy now. So Tritzy stands for, its name's even longer than Fitzy's, it stands for tetramethyl, that's the T, and then the R is for rhodamine, so rhodamine, okay, and then the ITC is then exactly the same for isothiocyanate, and the whole structure is very, very similar to the structure of Fitzy. Okay, so we'll start off by looking at the structure of the rhodamine molecule, because this is what the whole thing is based on, basically. We'll then progress to tetramethyl rhodamine, and then finally we'll add an isothiocyanate molecule on to get uh, tetramethyl rhodamine isothiocyanate. Right, okay, so let's draw out the structure of rhodamine, and basically it's almost identical to fluorazine. So, we'll start by drawing these three uh, groups again, uh, well, these three rings, and again there's an oxygen present there. Okay, so here are these three, whoops, three aromatic rings that are joined together. Okay, and now we'll add on the double bonds. So there is a double bond here, a double bond here, a double bond here, then a double bond here, just like we saw in fluorescine, okay? And then two double bonds here, again, identical to as we saw in fluorescine. Right, now the difference is this time we don't have an oxygen double bound up here, instead we have a nitrogen atom, okay? And this nitrogen atom will then have uh, two hydrogens bound off it, and because it has four bonds, therefore. It means that one of these bonds has been formed by two electrons which were both donated by the nitrogen. And that means that effectively the nitrogen has given away an electron and therefore has gained a positive charge. Because the understanding of covalent bonds is that one electron comes from each uh, member of that bond. If the nitrogen provides both electrons in, then it will be as though one of those electrons still belongs to the nitrogen, but the other, it, the understanding will be that that now belongs to the other member of the bond, okay? So the nitrogen has effectively donated one of its electrons away. Uh, now, you might say, well, surely that means the other member of the bond will get a uh, negative charge, okay? So we might expect this hydrogen up here to have a negative charge. Well, the reason it won't have a negative charge is that it will have originally come along with a positive charge, so it might have just been a proton in solution. And when it received that electron, it became neutral again, and it's passed the positive charge effectively onto the nitrogen. Okay, now over here, meanwhile, uh, where we had the alcohol group in fluorazine, we now have an am amino group. Okay, right, then it's exactly the same afterwards. We then put a benzene ring down here. Okay, so the double bonds. And then this benzene ring has a carboxylic acid group on, so pretty much it's an identical molecule to fluorazine. So this is the structure of rhodamine. All that we've changed is these two groups up here. This was a carbonyl group in fluorazine, and this was an alcohol group in fluorazine. Right, now, to convert this from being rhodamine into uh, tetramethyl rhodamine, okay, which is also often abbreviated to TMR for short, so tetramethyl rhodamine, what we need to do is take off these four hydrogen atoms. So there's a hydrogen atom here, a hydrogen atom here, and two hydrogen atoms here. And what we're going to replace them with is methyl groups. Okay, so shall I draw this entire structure out again? I think it will be worth it. So I'll draw the entire structure out again. It doesn't hurt to revise. Okay, so here's our first benzene ring again. So we'll put the double bonds on now. Our second aromatic ring, um, which has a single double bond, whoops, there. Okay, and then our final aromatic ring over here, which has a double bond there, a double bond there, and now it has this nitrogen up here, which now has two methyl groups bound to it instead of two hydrogens. Okay, and it still has a positive charge there. Similarly, over here, we now have an amino 
group that has lost its two hydrogens, whoops, and I'm about to draw them anyway, um, and has acquired two new methyl groups, okay? So we've now got four methyl groups on the whole rhodamine molecule, which is why this is going to be called tetramethylrhodamine. Okay, and then here is our benzene ring down here with a carboxylic acid group here. Okay, so this now is the structure of tetramethylrhodamine. Okay, so if we want to now convert it into tetramethylrhodamine isothiocyanate, which is tritsy, uh, then we just need to stick an isothiocyanate group on. And basically, we stick it onto this carbon here. So we stick on our nitrogen, which will be double bound to a carbon, which will be double bound to a sulfur. And this molecule then now is tetramethylrhodamine isothiocyanate, or tritsy for short. Right, so we've seen Fitzy and Tritzy, which are these two uh, main examples of fluorochromes. Well, they're, they're, they're two very famous examples of fluorochromes which can be used in immunofluorescence and certainly used to be used, and I believe they are still used. Okay, right. Uh, so, let's now discuss the um, fluorescence, the physics of fluorescence in a bit more detail. So basically, these fluorochromes, which we now have beautiful pictures of, uh, they will have a huge number of electrons in these molecules, okay? And basically, these electrons can exist at different discrete energy states. So basically, the amount of energy that any electron in this molecule has is not just a continuum, basically. It can't just have any old energy it wants. There are only certain energies that it is allowed, and these are called the different energy levels for this electron. So people often draw diagrams like this. Okay, so these represent the discrete energy levels that an electron would be allowed. So it's an important concept to understand that it's not just allowed to take on any energy it likes. There are these discrete energy levels, and these are the only uh, energies that this electron is allowed to have. Okay, right. So let's say that originally our electron is down here on this energy level here. Okay, and basically this is why it will only absorb photons of a certain frequency, because remember frequency determines the energy of the photon. Okay, so in order to absorb the photon, it has to that photon that it's about to absorb has to give it the exact right amount of energy to jump up one of these energy levels, because if it doesn't give it the exact right amount of energy, then it might take it into the middle of one of these energy levels, and the photon is not allowed to exist in the middle of the energy levels. It has to exist on one of the energy levels. So, this is why there are very specific photons that it can absorb. It has to absorb a photon that will give it enough energy to move onto one of these energy levels, but not too much energy that it will take it over that energy level. It has to be exactly right. Okay, so let's say it absorbs uh, this photon. Okay, so let's say this is the photon of excitation here. And let's say it gives it enough energy to move up into this energy level here. Basically, what's going to happen is the photon will go up into that higher energy state, but it doesn't stay there for long. It wants to release the energy back out. But when it releases it back out, it does not move straight back down to the energy level that it was originally on. Instead, it will drop back down onto this intermediate one here, okay? And that means that it's going to release a smaller amount of energy than the amount it originally absorbed, and it will release this as the photon of emission. Okay, and this will contain lower energy and therefore will be of lower frequency. So this is the principle of fluorescence, that you've got electrons being hoisted up to higher energy levels, and then when they fall back down, they don't fall back down all the energy levels that they were originally hoisted up. They fall them down, um, you know, they fall down in multiple steps and therefore in release the uh, energy in uh, multiple packets, basically, and each of these packets is smaller than the packet that it originally absorbed, and therefore is emitted as a photon of a lower frequency. Okay, right. Uh, so, 
Now that we understand fluorescence, we understand that these two molecules, Fitzy and Tritzy, if we shine certain photons of a specific frequency onto them, they will absorb them and emit some other uh, photon of a different frequency. And the common, the common, um, the common example of fluorescence that we're used to is that, you know, if you shine UV onto something which is invisible, then suddenly it will glow a visible colour, maybe green or blue or something like that. Uh, that's what we're used to as fluorescence. Uh, but of course, UV has a higher frequency than blue light, okay? So basically, the electromagnetic spectrum looks like this. Uh, right at the bottom, the lowest frequency waves are radio waves. Okay, then up from radio waves you have uh, microwaves, okay, whoops, microwaves, which are used by mobile phones, I believe, and also they're the things that are used in microwave ovens, okay, then after that you have infrared, okay, so this is the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. After infrared you then have the visible portion of the spectrum, where the visible light is, and the order it goes in is that um, the lowest frequency visible radiation is red, middle frequency is green, okay, and then highest frequency is blue. So that's why this portion of the spectrum that is below red is called infrared, because it's below red, okay, and the next portion up is the ultraviolet portion because it's beyond violet, which is uh, the highest of the visible light, which I haven't shown here, but it's above blue, basically. And then after that, the other more dangerous things come in, x-rays, and then finally gamma rays. Okay, right. Uh, so, usually what we think of as fluorescence is that you are shining photons of UV which are invisible and which have a higher frequency than any visible light and those will be absorbed and then the fluorochrome will release a form of radiation with a lower frequency and that takes you into the visible portion of the spectrum and then it will emit some visible photon and that's uh, what we usually think of as fluorescence but it's a much more general property of just absorbing any old photon of a certain frequency and then releasing another photon of a different frequency. Okay, it doesn't mean that the emission photon necessarily has to be in the visible spectrum. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, in the next video, what we'll do is move on to talk about the two different types of immunofluorescence, which are direct immunofluorescence and indirect immunofluorescence.